Good morning to you. If you are uh, visiting this morning, so am I. Um, so uh, I wouldn't know if you're uh, uh, not a regular member here, but visiting. Uh, but I am glad to be here. I appreciate the invitation uh, by Hunter and and Drew and uh, uh, faith that the elders have given me. I bring your greetings from. Well, I pronounce it Wetumpka, but the people down in Alabama, down there uh, outside of Montgomery, call it Wetumpka. Uh, I've been there about nine years. That's what I've called home. And anyway, it's a it's a privilege to be a fellow uh, Alabamian. Uh, but I'm originally from Tennessee, so I just want you to know that. Um, but uh, I found that when I moved here, you had to be of one or two religions, either um, uh, Alabama or, or you know Auburn. Uh, and I found myself out of place because I'm a Florida State graduate, so I'm in big trouble, <laughs> big trouble. <laughs> so glad to be with you, and uh, if you are uh, visiting with you, let me tell you what a privilege it is to be a, a brother in Christ. I've never met most of the people here, but they are brothers and sisters of Christ. You are of mine, and so we are family, and uh, we're all going to the same place. And uh, and uh, lesson today is about heaven, and I will not have the time enough to exhaust that topic. It's an invitation for you to think about it, not that you don't know about it, but for you to uh, recover, I guess, this very important uh, uh, element. And my takeoff point, like it was for Bible class, is an event, actually a letter, but an event in the life of Paul of Tarsus, and that's where uh, I will begin. For me to live is to Christ, to die is gain. Those are the uh, verses right at the end of the reading from Philippians 1. If you like to turn there, that's where I'll be um, uh, shortly in this, uh, this text. The uh, letter of Philippians is one of uh, four, and that may not be the right clicker, so I'll try the other one. Nope. So I'll try back the new one. There we go. And you can't see what's there, but it's a model in downtown Rome, capital of a modern-day country of Italy, there is a museum, a museum of Roman civilization, and they met out a gigantic uh, model of what um, Rome was in the time of the first century AD, a glorious time of Rome. Rome has five and a half million people, precious souls of God living in it now, but back then it was only two million, but it was the largest city that the world had ever seen. And somewhere in the bend of the Tiber River, that's the river, Rome began its story as a city about eight centuries before, and it had quickly risen to power from nothing, a bunch of mud huts in the middle of the eighth century B.C. By the time that Christianity is born, the life of Christ, the life of Paul, it is the largest city in the world, two million people. Nobody had ever seen anything that big, and if you had had, uh, if you'd been born back then and had a chance to walk into it, you'd have been amazed at the, the last 20 miles of every street that went into Rome that was covered in marble, and then structures that went up to the heavens. The Colosseum is the most well-known one today. It's ruins, uh, but it only seated 50,000 people, really. The largest structures were like the Circus Maximus, largest entertainment center ever in the history of the world. It seated 250,000 people, and they did their version of NASCAR and uh, Formula One racing there. They had chariot races, and it was absolutely amazing. Rome, where we want to be is uh, in one of those apartment buildings in the bend of the Tiber River. You see, that was the Jewish ghetto. There were a lot of Jews in Rome at the time. We know that there were at least 12 synagogues. And, uh, but in the year 61 AD, there was an apostle that was there. He's going to be there for two years, from about the year 60 to 62. And, of course, I'm talking about Paul of Tarsus. It has been 26 years since he uh, was converted to Christ, and a lot of things have happened to him. You can read that list in 1 Corinthians. It's a partial list of the price that he paid during his lifetime for being Uh, an apostle and disciple of Christ, near death many times. But now he's in trouble with Roman law. He is a Roman citizen. He was accused of something and nearly killed by a mob, and when he appealed to his Roman citizenship, well, when you do that, you get a free trip to Rome. He had never been to Rome before in his life. He's about 55 years old. That's my best guess. And uh, that is beyond, by the way, the normal life expectancy of a man at that time. Definitely beyond his. He should have been dead many times with what he experienced. But uh, he uh, will call himself in the letter of Philemon, which he wrote probably in the same year as Philippians, an old man. By the standards of that time, 55 or 60 is an old man. 
Um, and definitely he feels that way. He's probably, he's renting an apartment in the capital of the world, in the seat of all human power. The man that owns the world at that time, his name is Nero, has uh, been emperor for about eight years. He came to power in about the year uh, 54 AD. And he was 16 years old. Now he's 23. And uh, he owns the whole world. And he's waiting to appear before him for a trial. And that has been the situation for several months, if not more than a year. He's paying rent on his own apartment. And maybe he's on the seventh or eighth story of a, a high rise, which they had in that time. On the, in the bend of the Tiber River, pro- probably in the Jewish ghetto. And, uh, and then there is a knock on the door. And the knock on the door reveals uh, a person that either knew or didn't. His name is Epaphroditus. That tells me that this gentleman, when he was born, was born to a pagan family because he was named by his mom and dad, probably his mom, uh, from Aphrodite, Epi Aphrodite. Epaphroditus means a gift from the goddess of love. So a love child, so to speak. And that's his name. There are more than one Epaphroditus in the Old New Testament text, by the way. Did Paul know him or not? Paul could not go outside. He was under house arrest. He had a Roman soldier from the Praetorian Guard, the elite soldiers. There were about nine to 12,000 of them, and they were the best trained military in the whole world. And uh, he, he is, uh, uh, has one of them assigned him every day. Can you imagine the conversation in the barracks of the Praetorian Guard every day when they get up? Who you got today? I got Paul uh, from the city of Tarsus. Oh, no. He's going to preach to you all day long. I've had him before. Run. Call in sick. Do something. What Paul never does is take a day off. Now he has moments of discouragement. That he does. And God even comes in a vision to him in Jerusalem in 57 when after a very courageous moment in his life, he's down. He thinks he's going to die in Jerusalem and God will come to him and say, you're going to make it to Rome. He always wanted to go to Rome. You see, he was a Roman citizen and could speak Greek fluently. And I don't know, he may have spoken Latin as well. Either way, he wanted to go to Rome. I think because, not for tourist reasons, he didn't want to go see the Colosseum. The Colosseum wasn't finished building, built, being built yet. And he didn't want to see the brutal entertainment system of Rome. Uh, what he wanted to do is uh, help out in the propagation of the seed of the gospel of the way of Jesus of Nazareth and the largest conglomeration of human beings in the world, two million people. If you're going to take the gospel to the whole world and you think you're going to do it in your lifetime, you better go to the big urban centers because <laughs> that's where, that's where you know, the seed may be planted and go. You need to go to the country too, but uh, you need to also go to the, the big urban centers of the world. So Epaphroditus, who on earth are you? I don't know if Paul knew him or not. Paul spent, Paul established the church in Philippi back in the year 51, about 11 years before. He was not alone. He had three companions with him, Luke, Timothy, and Silas. He was there for a few weeks, and then he had left and gone on. He had come back during the third missionary journey and stayed for a few weeks. So he'd been there twice, but he was off the grid You know, they didn't have internet. They didn't have phones. So how do you find out what happened to the Apostle Paul? He's been, haven't heard from him for five years. How do you know that? Where's he gone? I don't know how they found out. But there was a lot of traveling for business reasons. There was more traveling in the first century than ever in history of antiquity. There were people traveling between the capital of Rome and uh, Alexandria of Egypt and Corinth. Those are the three largest cities in the world. And Ephesus and, yes, ships. Now, they didn't have planes. They didn't have trains. But they had ships now that would crisscross. And the Romans owned everything. And they patrolled and provided security and You could catch a ride on one of those grain ships that bring grain from Alexandria of Egypt and bring it to the capital of Rome. Or you could take one ship across from the tip end of Italy to uh, Patras or Brindisium. And then you could catch a Roman road that would take you into Athens. And from there, you could go to Corinth and you could ship and go to Ephesus on the coast of what we call Turkey today, Asia Minor back then. It was a highly traveled moment in history not the way we look at it. We travel so much, so fast, so quickly, but for the ancient times it was. 
It had taken nearly a thousand mile journey for Epaphroditus to get from Philippi in northern Greece, Macedonia, all the way to Rome. I don't know if Paul knew him when he opened the door. I don't know. All I know is that whether you knew him or not, it took about two seconds to find out who he was, realize, wow, you came a thousand miles. And by the way, all indications is he's very sick. He's going to nearly die. He, this journey, he had probably took off work. You have to read between the lines. What, did people have two months to travel just like that? Epaphroditus didn't he have a family and jobs, but he brings the gift that the Philippians church is going to give to Paul to encourage him. Maybe he needs money. Let's send him some. They had a meeting. The church did. We love Paul. We finally found out who he is after five years of not knowing. Let's send somebody who can go, who can take off work, who can provide a piece of pie for the journey, who can provide a, a, a coat, a donkey, whatever. You know, imagine that meeting of the church Philippi. Great church. Paul will love that church all his life. They were, they were the best. He had established many churches, but he was very, very excited about that. You see, the letter of Philippians, and I think I'm pushing the right clicker. There we go. It's a thank you letter. It's a thank you letter because when you get unexpectedly a token of the love and fellowship of somebody, you, you, you want to write them. And that's what the whole four chapters of Philippians are about. Thank you. That's what the theme of it is. Thank you. It reminds us we need to say that often. I appreciate the prayer this morning. What do you and I have to be thankful for? Start the list, including the church, the fellowship that we have in it, the encouragement of fellow believers, the gospel in your language, and you have multiple translations. No excuses. You can know what God wants of you and me and Wow, thank you, Philippian church. They were the best. They had been generous from word go. I don't know how much money they had, but they probably had more money than, say, the churches in Judea because they didn't experience a famine. They were in a Roman colony. They probably had, uh, you know, the, their economies was going well. And they probably had good jobs. But regardless of whether they were rich or poor, that's not how you measure generosity. Remember, Jesus highlights the uh, poor widow that gives a mite, right? And he says, she is the example of generosity. The Philippians got that lesson from the very beginning. And so that's how, what spurs the letter of Philippians. It is, please go down and send somebody that's in his house because he can't go out. Down eight, seven stories. Go find the scribe down the street. Uh, that's an amanuensis. They didn't have paper. That would be a, a, a scroll made out of animal skin. They didn't have a quill usually. Paul was the most prolific writer of the New Testament, but he had to use scribes most of the time and dictate it. And so he dictates the letter of Philippians. Quick, write this. Send it off quick. All the, way, all the way back a thousand miles. That's going to take about six weeks to get back. By the way, Epaphroditus is sick as a dog, and Paul will give thanks to God that he managed to survive that illness after he collapses maybe in his, in his house, after he delivers the gift uh, of the Philippians and their love. He was very sick. And thus begins the letter of Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints, in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the first words that he dictates. It follows a typical Greco-Roman letter. First, you, tell, you sign it at the beginning. That's the way they did it in the first century, not at the end, at the beginning. Then you write the addressees. Then you <clears throat> utter a prayer. Uh, that will be in what follows in these verses after that. And, and then you write the major reason for your, uh, the major content of the letter. And then you close out with greetings. That's the basic five parts of Greco Roman letter. Right here, you see the first two right here. This is Paul. What's his last name? He doesn't need one. We don't know. Paul is his Greco Roman name, Saul is his Jewish. He's Paul. Everybody knows him. Everybody's going to get this letter, does. Everybody knows him. He's the 13th apostle. He's the one that was added on, as if one abnormally born will be one of the references of himself. There were the 12 apostles. Of course, one had to be replaced uh, to, to fill, fulfill the 12, um, and, and then he was added on. I was the one abnormally born. This is Paul. 
And I have Timothy, a young man that I love. I've known him for 10 years. He's been, been my assistant in my travels. And he was there in Philippi. You know him. You love him like I do. So he's hovering over Paul's shoulder. And he says, we are both. Uh, he could claim authority. But as he says, I don't need to claim authority with you. I don't need to impress you with academic skills. Paul's the only PhD of all the apostles, by the way. But he never uses that one. He uses from time to time his authority. If you're teaching false heresies, he will remind you he is an apostle. But he says, no, you know, you need to remember me as a servant. Servant of Jesus Christ. And Timothy is too. Doulos, slave. A voluntary slave of Jesus Christ. That's what we are. We're voluntary. We voluntarily choose to, to serve Christ, to serve the church. It's a voluntary business. You have to choose. So commit yourself again on this Lord's Day to serve the Lord's cause, his kingdom, his church, to the best of your abilities. That's what you are. That's what we are. We are servants of Jesus Christ. This letter is written to all the saints of Christ Jesus who are at Philippi to the leadership, the deacons, and the elders. And then he gives his favorite uh, reference in, in a, a blessing that he gives usually more than once in his letter, sometimes at the end. Grace, grace, charis. Is how you say that in the language that's written in? Chai, Irene, grace and peace. He is a Greco-Roman who's a Jewish Orthodox guy. That's how he grew up. And now the only thing that matters to him is a Christian, follower of Christ. And grace and peace are his favorite terms that he uses. In the map, and I'll try it again. There we go. That's where Philippi is, right toward the north. He is off the map to the, to the uh, left of your screens here on your monitors. And, and that's where Italy is. He's in Rome. And that's where Philippi is in northern Greece and Macedonia. And that's where he remembers back 11 years ago when that congregation started. He remembers traveling on the Ignatian Road. He loved to travel on highways to connect the various big cities. He would bypass small cities like Amphipolis or Apollonia, a city between Philippi and Thessalonica, because he had an idea that he wanted to share the gospel to all the major urban centers of the world before his time on this life uh, expired. He remembers when he got to Philippi. These are fields that modern Greeks cultivate. But back then, uh, what amazes him when he got there with Luke is Luke probably, who probably was from there, had to tell him, listen, a big battle happened 90 years before uh, the year 50 A.D. when Paul and, and companions got there. And there were a lot of buried Roman soldiers in the, in the landscape in those fields that you see there. The Battle of Philippi between Roman legions and the Civil War. And there were a lot of people that were dead there. Maybe he remembers also about the first conversion that he had. This is a little teeny thing. You can barely fish anything in it. It's called the Crenides and it's outside of Philippi. Paul remembers that in Philippi when you entered, there was no synagogue. There was no Jewish synagogue, which is weird. Every other city he'd ever gone to, there was a Jewish synagogue. So why is there not a synagogue here? And the answer is because 90 years, a Roman commander had kicked out all the Greeks and the Jews from Philippi, and therefore they were all descendants of Roman families. When you looked on the doorbells, uh, they were all, you know, uh, Roman names. They ended in U.S. instead of O.S., uh, Latin instead of Greek. What happened here? I thought this was Greece. It's his first major city in Greece to be in. And it looks like it's a Roman colony, so to speak, very much in this, uh, in this time. Let me let you know that there are 113 inscriptions we have found in the city, ruins of the city of Philippi from which this, to which this letter is addressed where the congregation lives. And they're all in Latin rather than Greek. That must have struck Paul immediately when he realized, why is everything in Latin? It's like a small Rome, even though he had not been to Rome yet. Did he ever go in the weeks he was there to see a, a theater production? You see, our ver their version of Netflix was, uh, was uh, theater, tragedies, comedies, and they, the Greeks had invented it and the Romans were now doing it because they didn't have to work anymore. They had slaves to work, so they simply spent their time uh, at gyms or uh, in entertainment centers like the Colosseum or chariot races or theatrical productions. If you visit Philippi today, you might be shown the prison cell of Paul. Did Paul remember that night? I'm sure he did. When he and Silas were beaten, when he uh, expelled a, a spirit from a girl, a young girl that has spirit of divination from Satan, 
uh, we kept following him around for three days. Do you remember that story? And, and uh, anyway, uh, that, that story is a very important one. Did Paul remember all these things when Epaphroditus, you know, popped up? I don't know, but what he wanted to do immediately was say, you need to send thanks to them. It's in chapter 1 that he begins saying thanks, and he'll say it all the way through chapter 4. And um, he gives a thanksgiving and a prayer as he starts out. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all are making my prayer with joy. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. You are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and defense and confirmation of the gospel. In spite of the fact that he has been arrested for four years, he spent two years under house arrest in a palace in Caesarea by the sea. Now, it's not a nice, it's a, not a dark, damp prison. It's a nice place. We've got those ruins too. But he couldn't move. He could receive visitors. But he was innocent. You remember, he's innocent of the charges. And yet, he can't get out of this nightmare. From 57, it's now 61, he has been um, impeded from doing what he likes to do. So he has taken advantage by sharing the gospel with Roman governors. And now, what is amazing, is in Rome, in his rented house, waiting for this 23-year-old to judge his life or his death. Remember, he's innocent. He, he is, gets to have a, a secret service assigned to him of the president every year assigned to him. He says, cool. <gasps> this is his view. I never thought I was going to get to preach the secret service, but I'm going to. One a day, they're here. What's your name? Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you how my life changed on a dime back in 34 B.C. It's now 61. 27 years ago, I thought I was going to be you know, a Supreme Court judge for the rest of my life. I thought I was going to get married. I thought, and then I understood what my real role in life was all about because, because something happened to me on the road to Damascus. You know, he says to the Philippians a thousand miles away, I wish I could FaceTime you. You know, Paul would say that if he lived today. I wish I could FaceTime you. I wish there were a good internet connection here. <laughs> I can't. So I'm going to have to dictate these words fast. And by the way, uh, Tychicus, you, I want you to put this scroll in your, in your bag, and I want you to get on a, a, a donkey, and I want you to make it all the way to Brindisi. You can catch a boat, go to Patras, and then head to northern Greece as soon as you can, or across the Epirus. I want you to get there as quickly as you can. You, I feel about you. I miss you. I haven't seen you in five years. It is right for me to feel this way. I hold you in my heart. You are all partakers. We're on the same team. It was my privilege this spring to be with the Church of Nazareth. The Church of it. There are seventy thousand Muslims, and there's one church that's there. There, uh, there. It's not like in Birmingham or in Montgomery where there are thirty churches around. It's the only church in the Middle East. You know. We're on the same team. Can you see the big picture? Can you see the way God looks at it? There is, uh, you know, uh, the church in Leeds. There's the churches in Birmingham. The churches in Montgomery. The churches in Florence, Italy, Rome, Athens, Nazareth, Cairo, Egypt. Can you see the big picture of the church? We are all on the same team, whatever language it is. God on this Lord's day. As we partake of the Lord's Supper and remember who we are and whose we are, God has the big vision who we are. That's something Paul had. He didn't have FaceTime, but what he had is he maintained whatever was going on personally in his life. And next week, he could either be dead or alive. There's only two outcomes to a Roman trial. And no, there are no Roman Im imprisonment. He's in prison waiting his trial. He's under house arrest waiting his trial. I hold you in my heart. You are partakers with me in his grace, both in my imprisonment, and he's not being an exaggeration. He has been in trouble with the law, and it's either life or death, life or death. Two buttons on the, on the desk. Two, two buttons are going to be, one of, two, one of two is going to be pushed. Could be next week, could be next month. In my defense, that's the word in original Greek, apology. Apology doesn't mean I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm a follower of Christ, and it may cost me my life. I'll defend who I am and what choices I have made that I will do. This is the important passage that leads me to just spend the rest of my time for a few seconds 
uh, talking about uh, heaven. Verse 21 in the same chapter. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Look, next week I'll either be alive or I'll be dead. If I live, the function, the focus of my life is Christ. If I'm executed, it's gain. You're not serious. Have you ever met a human being that's not afraid to die? He said, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. You know, Paul doesn't know how he's going to die. We probably do. He doesn't. It's 61. We know that he's going to die about four years later. He doesn't know that. His abilities to, prophetic abilities, do not apply to himself personally. He can't heal himself, and he can't foresee his own future. God has to tell him you're going to go to Rome, but he doesn't tell him how. He doesn't know. He's at where you and I are at. We don't know if tomorrow morning we're going to wake up or not. Here's the point. Do you believe in life after death? Do you believe in heaven? I only have about 10 minutes. But what I'm going to do is take off from these words of Paul and, and find that kind of assurance, that kind of, that says, look, whatever happens tomorrow morning, if I wake up or not, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Which I shall choose, I cannot tell. There are days when I'm not sure. You can't threaten me with death penalty. Not if you understand what is the assurance that we have of what lies on the other side of this life. The question is, do you believe it? Heaven. I've, I've been in the Lord's church all my life, but are we assured? I've only been close to losing my life once. So maybe some of you have been through a lot more than that. And it was about, it was in Birmingham, actually. Uh, brought from Tennessee for emergency heart surgery, and I have part of my heart that's uh, mechanical, and part of my AOR artery that's made out of Dacron. That's what space-age material they use in the uh, sh shuttle. They used to. Before I went into surgery, they told me you have 50-50. If they tell you that, How are you doing? And they put the gas mask over you. How are you doing? Where are you at? God, if it is your will, give me more time to raise my children, see my grandchildren, serve the church. But if, if the other option is what is your will, it's not the Roman emperor that's going to kill Paul. Paul believes that, you know, presidents, emperors, people in power, they think they're in charge of the world. They think you're in charge of your life, and they can execute me. Unless God steps in, Nero will, and he will four years later. But for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I get to go home. Now, why should I feel terrified of going home? Heaven. Heaven. I want you to look at the words that follow. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Paul, let's get this straight, does not have a death wish in the year 61. It's not because I've had enough. I've got enough scars on my back from the trips and the beatings that I've taken. Five times with a rod, three times stoned, left for dead. All the list that he makes in 1 Corinthians 11. No, no, that's not it. Um, I, you just, I get to go home. I get to go home. <sighs> I'm scared of dying, sure. But scared of death, No. Question, what is after this life? There is either something or there is nothing, right? I don't know if you know this song, but they made a movie out of it. 
Uh, you either know it or you don't. And uh, it's called, um, the group is called Mercy Me, and Bart Millard was the writer and the main singer. And it was a, a, a most productive single of all times in the Christian Contemporary series. I uh, got the Dove Awards 2002, so it's been around for about 16, 17 years. And at least the last time I looked at it, it sold two and a half million uh, sold and even crossed over to secular radio stations as well. And it's uh, the text of uh, the song, I Can Only Imagine, is uh, inspired by the writer, inspired by the writer Bart Millard when he lost his father. His father had unfortunately his youth been quite abusive of him, and a latter part of his life came around. And that's a very uh, heartwarming, inspiring story. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, a story of a uh, denominational world, so uh, let me uh, encourage you to use a grain of salt, but uh, I just want to refer to the, the words very quickly. It's about abuse and redemption, and it's about heaven. I can only imagine. That's what the time. I can only imagine. See, his father came around before his death. My father is a, uh, was a teacher of some of you, and um, he's a powerful preacher and has been my favorite theologian all my life and faithful and an example to me. My father-in-law, on the other hand, came from a, a traditional denominational world, Catholic world, and, and, but was converted to, uh, to New Testament Christianity and seven years before his life. I lost my mother when I, I, was, fi when I was 50, no, 30, and I lost my, my son, my first son, when he was uh, just a day old. His name was Christopher. What lies on the other side of death? What does? For you? For our loved ones? For anybody else that's there? What's interesting about heaven in the world that you and I live in of 2019 is that most people are more interested in hell than they are in heaven. Why on earth? They use the word a lot. They use it as an exclamatory thing to make a point. They never say, heaven, you know? Why not? Why not? You know, I teach ancient literature, and in the 14th century, Dante Alighieri wrote uh, a journey into the afterlife. You see, the 14th century people, seven centuries ago, were uh, wondering, what lies after death? There was a lot of death and dying in the 14th century. And uh, they were wondering, okay, and they posited, uh, you know, hell, then they made up a world called purgatory, doesn't exist in the Bible, and then there's heaven. Now, to be honest with you, Dante, the writer, wrote, wanted you all to go to heaven. But guess what? In the last seven centuries, the most famous parts of this epic uh, uh, work of literature is not heaven nor purgatory. Guess what everybody reads? Hell. Why? Why do we are so fascinated with hell? Why is that? When heaven is what we should be. Um, I found one dogmatic work that had two pages dedicated to heaven and 87 pages dedicated to hell. Why? Why? What's, what's the deal here? Okay? What is, let's get this straight about uh, what we can know about heaven, and I will call our lesson to a closing in about five minutes. Um, no one has ever visited heaven and returned to hell uh, return to tell the, the experience. Paul himself will have a vision, and he will try to describe it in the best that he can in his letter of 2 Corinthians 12. He will say, I know a man, he talks about himself, their person, who was taken up in the third heaven. That was an expression used in the first century for, I was taken up. Were you, were you physically taken up, like beamed up, like Spock in Star Trek? Uh, well, I was taken up. Whether I was in my body or not, I can't tell. All I can tell you is that I saw things that I can't describe with human words. And he will say, I, I had that, you know, glimpse into the heavens. And, of course, you may recall when Stephen, the first Christian martyr recorded in the book of Acts, when he is about, he's the angry Sanhedrin is about to grab him and throw him in a rock pit and start throwing rocks. And he has a, a, a vision into the heavens. It's like the clouds break out and he sees a vision. That is the only instance that we have of people. Uh, here's the point. If you want to find out, not about hell, but bad about too, I want to think about heaven on this particular day. If you want to find out real things about what lies after this, 
why Paul can say, for me to live is Christ. If I live next week, I'm going to serve the church and Christ like I have for the last 27 years. But if I die next week, I get to go home. Heaven. There have been so many false claims about heaven. People claim they went and came back, you know. But the fact is, all we know about heaven, all we need to know about heaven, the most wonderful reason for wanting to go to heaven are all contained in an inspired word of God, and that's where we need to turn, not to movies or to literature or anything else. For me to die is gain, says the Apostle Paul. Is heaven real? Well, think about it. There are only two possibilities, either yes or no. There's no middle button. There's no gray Kind of like with Paul, next week you're going to live or die. Two outcomes to a Roman trial. They either release you or they execute you. But the way in which you're executed, if you're a Roman citizen, you get your head beheading, quick death. If instead you're not a Roman citizen, you get to die slowly. Take a week on a cross if you can. If they can, prolong your death. That's the way it's going to be. But after death, there are only two possibilities. It either exists or there doesn't. There either is nothing or there's something. And if there's something, is the way in which I live here going to matter, count in the heavens, in the life after death? I want to go home to be with God the way God intended. When he created the Garden of Eden, he created a world in which we would live with him. Then we blew it. And the restored garden of Eden is not going to be down here on earth. It's in the home in heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you. There's going to be plenty of room. There's going to be plenty of room. The point is, are we going to be there? The tragedy is in 7.3 billion people in the world today. And where are you? Most people not only are fascinated with hell and seem to be driving 180 miles towards it. And that's not my judgment, by the way. It's God that decides. I don't send anybody anywhere. Neither do you. It is God's call. But he says, I want you to come home. I want you to sit at my dinner table again. I want to call you family. And you need to do it now here on earth in the church. And then I will translate you into the kingdom of heaven that is already. I love the expression that is in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. And I'll close with this for today. It's my privilege to go to St. Peter's Cathedral. I was just there in February, and I'll be back with another group. Bettinini was the architect, and he envisioned a grandiose, there's the facade of the biggest temple of God on earth. It's uh, two and a half football fields in length, and has columns that reach to the heavens, and there's over a hundred statues of what are supposed to be like saints, people who have gone on before you and were in the faith, and they're up there along the massive arms of St. Peter's Square that are welcoming you in, bringing you in. And there are all those statues of those who have gone before. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and following, follows about the witness of those who have gone before. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the heaven is real. And what we are in is in the playground. We're in life. We're alive today. And we're on the playing field. While in the stands up there, in the heavens, are all those that have gone before and were faithful to God and are cheering for you and I to be faithful and to make it home to heaven. That is part of it. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. As you hear my voice today, you're either in Christ or you're not. If you're in Christ, do you believe in heaven? Please nod your head. If you're not in Christ, God wants you to come home. But he gives you free will. I have no assurance of tomorrow, and neither do you. The way to go home is simple. It's not complex. He fixed your life and mine by sending his son. 
And he signified by a simple act, you're, I'm not going to obey, disobey God anymore. I want to obey. Your commitment today can be enshrined in some water. Baptism. Would you come as we stand and sing?